William Gibson once said, The future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. The time has come to draw attention to science fiction stories written all over the planet. Stories made of different languages, colors, shapes, hopes and beliefs. The future happens everywhere. That's why we are here. Anna Rushi, I'm speaking from Brazil, and that's our translation panel today. We are here to talk about please get this book closer to your language, a translator's roundtable to find out which book to translate next. We do have amazing translators here. Chiara Cigarini from Italy, Diego Cepeda from Colombia, Emily Jean from China, and thanks for making the time for being with us so late. Uh, Yana from Brazil, and I will be your host. Uh, in replacement of Fabio Fernandez, he wasn't able to join us because internet issues. So I would like to invite you to present yourselves and our first guest to talk will be Chiara, please. Yes. Ciao Chiara. Ciao, ciao a tutti. So my name is uh, Chiara Cigarini. I got a PhD from Beijing University, Beijing Normal University, and I'm currently an adjunct professor at the Kafoskari University of Venice. Um, so I, yeah, I, I started doing research um, uh, focusing on contemporary Chinese science fiction since uh, uh, my undergraduate uh, courses in, at, uh, at uh, my university in Italy. And yeah, that's my background. <laughs> Yeah, okay, amazing. We do have amazing translators here today, everybody. So, Diego, please, and hi from everybody who's in, who is introducing themselves in the chat as well. Hola, Diego, ¿cómo estás? Hola, ¿cómo están? Uh, so, sorry if my English is a little rusty. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, I've been a translator for around four years, I think. Uh, I actually started because I I was reading bizarro fiction, which is like a really small subgenre in in the United States, and I wanted to translate it and bring it to Colombia. But uh, I ended up becoming a, a Portuguese translator. Uh, I started with poetry, uh, and I've translated a couple books, uh, novels, and even more poetry books right now so it's such an honor to be with you guys right now and, and I, i'm really now happy now the other is all our my hour and thank you for translating portuguese such inspiring books because i know <laughs> your work thank you for doing this emily please have the floor hi uh i'm emily jen speaking from china um, so right now we're 11 p.m. and it's great to see all of you. Um, so I translate from Chinese into English and the other way around. Um, and I'm currently pursuing a PhD degree in East Asian languages and literature um, at Yale University. So kind of doing academia is my second life. Um, and that in translation kind of goes on um, kind of interchangeably at, at times because I also study contemporary Chinese science fiction like Kiara. Um, I also am leaning more and more towards cognitive linguistics and translation. So that's been my recent interest. And I can also see how that's been influencing my work as well. So it's been an interesting journey. So yeah, it's great to be here and happy to see you all virtually. Okay, thanks. Thanks again. And Iana, please, to the yeah. ball. 
<laughs> Tudo bem. Hi guys, uh, my name is Iana. I am from Brazil. I am a translator and an editor at Eita Magazine. We translate uh, Brazilian authors into English. So I, I do, at the moment, I'm doing mostly uh, Portuguese to English translations, but I also do English to Portuguese. These are my two languages. Um, I also work with uh, another Brazilian zine that publishes uh, historical fiction. So very different from sci-fi or fantasy, <laughs> but I love it. And I've been um, uh, shortlisted for the Rosetta Awards for translated fiction in the short form category, which was a, such a huge honor because that piece that was uh, shortlisted is actually my first like published translation. So it was like very huge mm -hmm. honor. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for the inter introductions, everybody. Our first question will be like our icebreaker. It will be why did it start translating? Why did it like because translating is hard. Nobody credits the translators <laughs> every time. So it's a very uh, we do have so much to learn, so much to do. You can make mistakes like it's part of the job. So, Kiara, could you begin our yeah, round? Sure. Uh, well, I started translating. Um, why? It's uh, it's because I, um, when I was uh, studying at university, I I I have chosen a courses a course focused on uh, trans translation and interpreting. And at that time, uh, I had to pick up um, a topic for my dissertation. And I bumped into contemporary Chinese science fiction. So I have chosen uh, an author and a short story for my, um, uh, sorry, for my master uh, dissertation. And then I, I kind of uh, I fall in love with Chinese science fiction. So I, I, I kept doing that. So that's my... Uh, that was my start, and then I started doing some collaboration with Future Fiction and Francesco, and and that's and, and that's the story. Thank you, Diego. I, my, my beginning was in college too. Um, I actually started doing a, a translating course, which was uh, well, it was with. Uh, a local professor from here. Uh, and my very first story that I translated was um, Carton Medic's Hammer Wives, uh, which I really loved. Uh, I tried to get it trans uh, to get it published and no one wanted to do it, <laughs> uh, which was the reason that, uh, well, one of the reasons that I started uh, Ediciones Vestigio because I, I am an editor too. Uh, so that's that's the way I started translating from English uh, and from Portuguese. It was because I worked for I've been working for around five years with Jeronimo Pizarro. Uh, Jeronimo is an expert in Portuguese contemporary literature and especially Fernando Pessoa. Um, and the very first project he came to me with was trying to translate uh, Pessoa's book of proverbs, which he uh, had compiled uh, before the, the, the World War, trying to win some money and print it in, uh, in the UK. Uh, and well, uh, it was a really long project that was I think it was uh, published around a couple of years ago, but that was the way I started uh, also translating Portuguese. Um, and yeah, that's that's how I've been working. I've been working freelance work for around some time. I translated a couple of books for Planeta uh, and I've been working for personal projects right now. Excellent. Emily, 
could you share your thoughts with us? Um, so I guess the way I got into translating science fiction, especially um, the story came in two parts. So part one is that as a child, I practically read too much. And that's how I kind of got into the dark hole of Chinese science fiction as a small child and kind of just bought into all of that. Um, so it's cool because I am now working with a lot of the authors who I've really just read growing up and I admired a lot growing up. So that's been really cool for me as a fan um, to be actually working with them and promoting their works um, to a broader international audience. We're more like preaching really. Um, on the other hand, as a high schooler, I used internet too much. Um, and that's how I stumbled upon the magic of subtitling. So I basically joined this subtitle TV show group to translate um, shows in English into Chinese for a Chinese audience. And we just kind of published the subtitles, just the subtitles online, so they can kind of pair it with their movies and to see um, the show for themselves. So I was involved in a group like that for a very long time. Um, then eventually after I graduated from college, um, that was also, well, the time when I was graduating, um, that was when the three body problem, so currently the most famous piece of Chinese science fiction that unexpectedly won the Hugo Awards. And that's how translated Chinese science fiction became a thing um, in itself. So that really inspired me. And also I have to mention with honor here that Ken Liu, who has been my mentor um, when I first joined the community, he was the one who introduced to me this great like sea of opportunities and told me that translating science fiction is a thing that can be done, that it's cool, and actually supervised a few of my first projects. So he really got me going and took me under his wing. So that kind of all came together and here I am right now. Wow, great. We can talk a little uh, about later about like subtitles and also fanfic writing. It helps very much young people to become translators and that's a exactly. very important role. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yana, please, could you share your thoughts with us? So that's a great segue. Um, I started translating when I was a teenager on a little website called fanfiction.net. <laughs> and it was obviously fanfic, like Harry Potter and X-Files, uh, the X-Files fanfic. And I started like just asking the authors if I could translate them to Portuguese and don't look that up, okay? <laughs> that was a long time ago. I've improved a lot. Uh, I also, at the time, I was also translating fan fiction from Spanish to Portuguese, but I lost that skill. I can't do that anymore. <laughs> and then there's a huge gap where I go to school and I study history. So uh, I didn't really like kept up with translating just a little bit, but I started teaching English. So was, I, I was always in contact with the language, but, and I also read maybe too much. <laughs> and a lot in English. So it was only like after college that I took a, an interpreter's course and I started interpreting simultaneous interpretation. And there's a lot of like um, stuff that they use for, for trainings or workshops. And I started translating the documents as well, not only interpreting, but also translating their, what they needed. And then, I was like, I really like this. I I really love this. Like, there's no comparison. I love teaching, but I loved translating. So I started looking for uh, courses on translation. I didn't have like the heart to go back to school and, and study four years of college. And I was like, no, there's gotta be another way. <laughs> and then I, I took uh, a few courses and that was like back in 2018, I guess. So it's very recent, actually. And then from there, I was like, what do I love? I love books. I love science fiction. I love fantasy. I want to work with this. And I started to get into the community, uh, reading uh, Brazilian authors, reading international authors through uh, some of our Strange Horizons, etc. And then... I really started to get into it. And when Strange Horizons uh, had a, a 
open call for submissions from Brazilian writers. It was then that I really got into like this, this specific uh, science fiction fantasy uh, subgenre because uh, a lot of Brazilian authors were trying to, to, were sending their submissions, but they didn't write in, in English. So I was translating for them. And really that's like how it all started. And now I'm here, we created uh, with a couple of friends, Eta Magazine to continue this work of translating uh, Brazilian authors into English. And uh, here we are. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. So not academic at all. I think I am like the, the black sheep here, but there you have it, fanfic. There is no wrong or <laughs> right in this kind of issue, no. So we are so glad that you are here with us. Personally, I, I translate only a little, but I do translators translations when I need a piece like to teach because I'm a teacher and I teach science fiction. And for example, I translated the short story from the Mexican Gabriela Damiran Miravete from Spanish into Portuguese because it's a beautiful short story and I really like to use them in classes and it's done by it's published in Mafagafo, a very good magazine that we have here in Brazil. But let's jump in in our second question. What do you think? Which book that you always wanted to bring to your language and the opposite way? Which book from your language you love to see translated? And think that we have already an audience from different parts of the world. So that would be a very good tip for editors that are watching us already. So jump in. <laughs> well, I think that the book that I really wanted in Portuguese, I myself couldn't translate because it was Japanese. I don't translate from Japanese. I don't read Japanese. Like, all I do is watch studio ghibli and that's it <laughs> so <laughs> but lucky for me as uh, just a few months after i discovered this book it's the memory release by yoko gawa let me write here in the chat um they had a translation from the memory police published in brazil like this year in april i guess so not long ago and i was so happy because i feel like this is the kind of book like that everyone should read. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you like to read or not, read The Memory Police, okay? And um, well, there are many authors that I would like to translate to English or to really to have them be read in any other language, but I think a favorite of mine is As Noites Marcianas, Okay, by uh, a Brazilian author that is Fausto Cunha. And uh, I don't know when this is gonna happen. He He's not alive anymore. I don't know who has the rights to his uh, books. So, but the, the, the translation of the title would be The Martianites. It's a short story collection that I really love. And I think there is like, just so much good stuff in his writing. And then also, uh, which is that um, even though there's really great books, um, most of them haven't been translated. Uh, well, because of a number of reasons, for example, uh, I know Luis Carlos has tried to be, uh, to speak with different translators. Um, and the thing is, for example, he's too Colombian. <laughs> so he uses a lot of jargon in his books uh, and trying to bring that to another language or even to another country is difficult. So yeah, that's that's one. I'll, 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 uh, I'll write the recommendations. And there's, uh, well, there's a couple of books that I've always wanted to have in Spanish um the first one because i uh, i first read about it in a blog uh, of of brazilian sci-fi 
which is um, Fausto Posset's Santa Clara Poltergeist. But because I hadn't read about it, I actually got the book like a couple of weeks ago, I think, uh, with, along with Basico Instinto. Uh, and they're really great books um, with cyberpunk. And I think that a really great flavor of Portuguese, of Brazilian science fiction. So that's one. Um, and the other uh, is one uh, one of the books from uh, Yasuka, Yasuka Tsutsui, the, the writer of Paprika, because I really, really love the what he's been what he's writing. And Yasuka, sorry, Yasuka. No, okay, I'm I'm out. I think that is Yasuka. And uh, he's a really great artist and writer, and he's published like 40 different books in Portu in in Japanese and right now in Spanish uh, I think that there's only the translator of two of his books which is precisely Paprika and um, Hombre Salmonella el Planeta Porno <laughs> uh, but yeah uh, I think that uh, I would really love to see more of his work translated especially because he's such a huge part of uh, of Japanese weird and science fiction. Uh, so yeah, those are like my recommendations right now. Wow, thank you very much. I think in the end of this conversation, we will have a, like a list of <laughs> names and authorships. Chiara or Emily? Yeah, uh, for me, it's not uh, only about which uh, novel or short story um, should be translated into uh, Italian, but it's also about which author, because I, as I mentioned before, I approached Chinese science fiction thanks to uh, an author in particular, uh, Han Song. And I think it's really uh, strange because he's uh, one of the two generals of Chinese science fiction, is uh, one of, he, he played a big part for the genre nativization. And, um, and I, I, I've always hoped to bring uh, his uh, short stories and novels into Italian, although I can understand why uh, his works aren't, his works are, can be considered um, as a bit, uh, I don't know, controversial from a political point of view or um, or some, uh, uh, some um, content that can be considered as uh, disturbing. But uh, I think uh, his works are wonderful. So, for example, uh, Subway, Dietje in, um, in, uh, in Chinese, or uh, Mars Shines Over America, Huo Xin Zhao Yao Mei Guo, are just, uh, just two of his uh, very famous novels that I think are wonderful, not just because they depict the monsters, uh, monsters produced by the Chinese modernization process, but also because he kind of talk to us about um, our, uh, like about humanity in general and uh, humanity's relationship with technology in general. So that's why uh, it's not just about, I think it's uh, wrong to consider uh, his novel as just a, a political weapon or as a, uh, as a, I don't know, consider science fiction in general as um, only as a soft, a tool for soft power, it's more complicated than that. And I, th I think Hansong is really deserves to be translated because it he really can give us, uh, uh, can, can let us uh, feel this uh, complexity. And uh, so that's, uh, that's the author. Uh, and those are the two novels that I hope uh, uh, will be translated soon. Also together with um, Red Ocean, um, uh, another very, very important novel. And as for the Italian part, which, uh, it, which Italian book I hope uh, will be translated into other languages, I hope that uh, since many of Italian mainstream work have already been translated into other languages, I think about Eco Calvino and other amazing writers, I think that uh, there are many female uh, Italian science fiction writers that deserve to be translated, such as 
Clelia Farris or Nicoletta Valorani. So that's my uh, recommendation. Oh, thank you so much. And thanks for the help, guys, here uh, on the chat, helping with <laughs> searching names on the web. Emily, please. Hi. I'm actually pretty glad that I got to speak class because my response is somewhat different from everyone else's. Um, and of course, I really enjoyed the huge list of book recs here. Um, but I think I'm just going to go in a direction that kind of stays away from talking about um, specific books, etc. And so first of all, I think I'll take the first part of the question and say it in a more kind of, I would say, I'll throw out the first kind of controversial bomb of the night, if that makes sense. Um, and I know Francesco somewhere out there watching and you might agree. So I think in general, I think it's less about what kind of books I want to see more in my language, I guess now um, using Chinese as the language I represent here. Um, I just want to say that I want to see less books from English being translated in Chinese in general. Um, and I say this because I feel like me and my generation, we grew up in this environment that's so overly saturated with English literature and also pop culture. And that's really just a lot of the things that people are watching and absorbing while growing up. So in contrast to that, I feel like other languages being translated into Chinese is just in general very under translated. And we also lack translators who can do that kind of work. Um, and the other thing is that when I read translated works from languages I don't know, um, such as a lot of European languages or even um, Japanese or even Korean countries that are supposedly closer to China geographically, a lot of them actually come from, let's say you translate Japanese into English and then someone who can do English to Chinese translations, take the English version and translate it kind of second handedly. And I think in general, I just want to see more direct translations from languages that are not English into Chinese. So that's my big hope here. And of course, I really appreciate FutureCon because this is what exactly this convention is promoting and that's all great. Um, and the second part of the question is, I think instead of kind of advertising a specific work, and I know that Kira has always been a huge Hansung fan since I've known her. Um, so Hansung was great, I agree. Um, but in general, I want to say that the one thing I want to see translated into other languages more is actually just the entire system of Chinese mythology, which comes up a lot in Chinese fantasy, um, which is kind of Chinese science fiction's dark side sister in a way um, mm -hmm. that people don't really talk about. So definitely that's one thing um, I want to see translated more. And it's great that more and more contemporary authors are alluding actively to Chinese mythology, Chinese tradition, history in their works. So that's really giving these texts a second chance of coming to life and giving us translators a way to try out with those classical texts and see how we render them in a more contemporary setting. So that's one thing I am currently working on personally. And definitely I want to see more translators getting involved and engaged and also editors who are interested in subjects um, featuring a lot of those stuff, um, trying to bring this to life instead of everyone kind of zooming in on what they see as the very mainstream kind of contemporary Chinese science fiction, which is all about, oh, like futurism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of the two large and broad answers I will give and I will leave no book recs for now. No, that was a very com complete answer, Emily. Thanks for, for sharing <clears throat> this all. And I, I will pick your hook to jump in in our next question because English is sort of a hub for all the science fiction world, right? Like everybody like goes into English to be known in other countries. And that's it's very complicated, especially when we are speaking about South America, because like Portuguese and Spanish are yeah, are easily to understand. And but we need like the I don't know, the English stamp to be to make this kind of I don't know, to make this kind of traffic and wait to spread new stories. And I would ask you about 
which science fiction magazines or published houses we know Francesco is here for future fiction that make a huge pr project in spreading stories from non-anglo non-anglo fiction stories so could you also name projects things that you like to be more often well uh there are magazines like constellation that it doesn't not only publishes in english but it's bilingual so publishes also in Spanish, I think that's a great uh, format. They, of course, it's not exclusive, but they, they're publishing a lot of uh, Latin American authors in both languages. So there is that, I think, uh, and, and they are brand new. Like I, the first issue was published last year, 2020, yeah. So I think it's, uh, little um, light to show zines how, that we can do something like this we can have more bilingual zines and, and whatnot we also have uh, some of our guys i'm going to pronounce this the way i pronounce it because i've never heard anyone speaking that word so bear with me um some of our accepts uh any languages as long as you have like an english translation so you have paired the, the original language and the, the English translation. And there's also ETA magazine that I'm editing. We are going to publish our first bilingual issue this year, at the end of this year. And it's a lot of, it has a lot to do with uh, watching uh, projects like Constellation and some of our working that were like, well, we were only publishing in, in English. Why don't we just publish in Portuguese? And, and Brazilian uh, uh, readers can also enjoy it, you know. I think you have more readers when you have more languages involved. Most of the world doesn't speak English. Uh, I think English is just like a road, it's not a destination like we talked about. Uh, so enjoy the road, use whatever you can, but you have to think bigger than that, I believe. There is also, again, I've never heard the, the word, the, this magazine name pronounced, so bear with my pronunciation. There is also Coreo magazine that publishes uh, just immigrant um, writers and diaspora authors. So it's, it's very specific about the type of voices they are amplifying. So you are necessarily going to have uh, other stories, other perspectives, uh, other languages, bilingual, trilingual people publishing and sharing their points of view on Coreo. And I think that's my main um, points, my main suggestions. I really love short stories. I really love like magazines. So I'm very passionate about it. I was just like thinking that uh, I recommended, the only novel I recommended was Yoko Ogawa's As Noites Marcianas by Fausto Cunha, Our Short Stories, Os Filhos de Asha by Isabor Quintieri. It's a short story, so that's my thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, perfect. And yeah, we will have um, a the next panel will be about magazines and it's good because this discussion is related it's a, like a warm-up discussion from the next panel that will be great because we are adding something new that i will discussion. be watching <laughs> the same the same yeah. Who, who's want to i can Go ahead, um... I know about, uh, and, and I know about it because an author of ours was published there uh, about the, it's a series of anthologies that, uh, okay, I don't know how to pronounce her name, so I'm sorry if I mispronounce it. I think it's Margaret Elgadotir. She's, she's a Nor Norwegian uh, writer, and she's been doing uh, a series of table books. 
uh, I think that it started with Africa and it's moved right now. She's publishing uh, American Monsters. She's published two different tones right now. So, for example, I know she has stories by, um, I don't know, Ramiro Sanchez, uh, and she also has stories by uh, Chilean authors. And, well, it's like a really, really long uh, list of different authors, um, which I, I think that it's a really great project, and it's a project that's been uh, translating different languages into English. So it's really good. Well, precisely because of the the bridge that you were speaking about, Anna. Um, oh, uh, okay, I'll I'll say, write recommendations after a while. But I've also been checking out uh, that there's, I think that small presses are beginning to publish uh, different languages right now. It, it's a really big risk for 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 us because. Most people actually want to read uh, English fiction uh, and Anglo fiction. But for example, well, uh, this is like some a little self promotion. But we've uh, in in Asians Vestigio, we're starting to publish uh, Portuguese uh, science fiction and well, in general Portuguese fiction. Right now, we're translating uh, Raúl Brandao's Humus, which is like such an important book for contemporary fiction uh, in Portugal. Uh, and I know, for example, here in Colombia, it, there's a small press that's named Tanuki. Those guys are publishing uh, Japanese fiction right now. Um, well, uh, it's really difficult because most of, uh, most of their work, they don't have any translators in here or any um, good translators, rather. Uh, so, for example, it's difficult because they're they're tasked with finding a, a government grant from Japan, and then uh, finding a, a good uh, Japanese translator. Um, and I know there's like a couple. Oh, Francesco uh, has been working really hard to bring non non English science fiction into his work um and yeah i i think that, uh, that those are like my first questions right now my first answers uh but if i think of anything i'll i'll write it down for you guys to to see in the in the youtube chat oh thank you thank you for such interesting thoughts and emily chiara yeah, um, yes, I can. Oh, oh, oh go no, ahead. No, 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 you, Amelia, you first. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think speaking of which, um, since we're on this conversation, I think I actually direct this conversation in um, kind of the plenitude of online forums. And um, since we talked about fandom and we talked about kind of those grassroots movements of translating earlier on, I just want to say that actually a lot of people I know, a lot of my friends um, first came to translating stories freely on a lot of these online forums. So such as Arc of Our Own, um, our favorite fandom site. Um, that's one of the places where so many translations just like happen naturally. Um, they can be of any genre, um, apart from fan fiction, which is, which is what it's known for. Um, people actually also post original stuff on it too. And I know like for a fact that people I know who study kind of translating between Russian and Chinese. Um, they only study the language, but they are really kind of harboring that skill because they want to translate fan fiction first, and then that gradually evolved into a more serious translation um, project, if I could say. And so I think that's actually where a lot of, especially younger generation people, um, especially students in colleges, in language colleges, are trying out their hand in this work, this art of translation. So I just want to say that apart from magazines and fanzines and all these effort that we kind of people in the science fiction industry have come to know already, um, I think the internet is definitely a place where a lot of the new ideas and the new trends and movements are happening. And that's also a place where people are actively pay paying a lot more attention to fiction written beyond the standard, oh, this is like written by fans who speak and use English. 
Um, and also as a result, um, Archive of Our Own has expanded its language categories to include more and more language users. And so I think that's also where I see um, becoming this a lot more international, internationally based hub um, where translators and writers come together. So I just want to like kudos to internet fiction. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's it. Kiara. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, I think I can answer to this question uh, again from the perspective of Chinese science fiction because I uh, recently I've done some research on the spread of this genre in, uh, in Europe, and I've noticed that um, before uh, Liu Cixin uh, won the uh, Hugo Award, there were very few magazine and uh, projects focused on this genre. So, for example, there was uh, Urania, uh, that's like um, a publica an Italian publication focused on uh, science fiction in general. They did uh, uh, two special e issues on the topic. But um, apart from that and Fata Morgana, another magazine, there were very few, uh, very few publications on the topic. Uh, right now, besides Francesco uh, in Italy, um, I found out that uh, there are mainstream publishing houses interested in the genre and also um, independent ones such as for example in Italy Ad Editore uh, they recently published uh, some short stories by, by Hao Jin Fang and also there are uh, the interesting part I think is also that some magazines that were initially uh, focused on just on uh, Chinese mainstream literature in translation started now to also to uh, to focus on on this genre and um, and so I think that the, the the what I, I mean is that right now we can find a very interesting publication from many different um, publishing houses genre not just in Italy but also for example in Germany there is capsule I think um, that uh, recently did an amazing work or in uh, in France, uh, Gen Taiyu, uh, if I don't know if I may, I may have mispronounced it, um, and um, Angle More, I think. So what I think is that uh, although it's um, after Lutzen won the 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 the, the Hugo uh, Prize, this gave a great input. So uh, the market is helping. Uh, is helping to promote this genre right now, and, um, and but is also promoting small and independent realities. So I think um, that's uh, that's really important, and I think that those realities are um, are, are are spreading and are uh, and are are doing an amazing job. And the example, the, the perfect example, I think, is uh, Francesco. Real, oh yeah notice that that's my thought oh, thank you very much hi rachel how are hi. you hi, how are you? you yeah do you do you like to introduce yourself or you can do it later whatever you feel more comfortable um yeah i can do it now um uh, i'm rachel cordasco i run the website sfitranslation.com and, um, and I write a lot of reviews about um, speculative fiction that's been translated into English. And I have a book about it coming out in a few months. So. That's it. Rachel Kordowski is a very important voice in translation. So we are very happy mm -hmm. that you'll join us. Thank you. And we do have so much interesting questions from the audience. I picked two to begin and we'll move forward. If you like to comment other questions that you are reading already in the chat on the chat, so be, <laughs> be our guest. The first I would like to ask is by Vanessa Geddes, a very good friend of mine. Uh, we do a podcast together with Tiago Ambrosio Lages. Vanessa is also from ETA's magazine and her question is how important is to be e to be an author yourself when we work as a translators and so the second question i pick from steph he she's in uk 
and make wonderful, wonderful comments in our chat already. She asking about how do you treat Creole languages in translators, uh, in translations. So I put the both questions together because they are asking about how you how your skills or how you do treat language when you do I, I don't know challenging translators translations. <laughs> Rachel, could you step in so we can sure. hear a little um, more of you? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that the um, being able to write, uh, first of all, being being a, um, a good reader, someone who reads a lot and who's got um, kind of an, an ear for, for language, you know, that's, that's always ideal. Um, and then when you're translating, uh, being able to simultaneously hear what um, what the the I guess from what I do what the literal translation is and then what sounds right in your um, target language so you know it, it might sound kind of uh, a little like it's right the translation's correct but it doesn't exactly sound as natural for instance in in English um, you know, I translate from Italian and uh, it's pretty close. Uh, the rhythm is pretty close, but sometimes the word is just not quite what people would say in, in English normally. And so, you know, you have to be able to be comfortable in, um, in, in just kind of modifying what you're translating so that it is, uh, it's in the spirit of what you're translating, but it also reads well. Because if it doesn't read well in English, then you know the people who are reading it who don't know Italian, they don't they don't care, you know, if it's like exactly right in the in the translation. What they want is to read a good story. And so you have to be able to it has to sound good in English. And I think that the best way to do that is by doing a lot of writing and a lot of reading. Um, and having a lot of different kind of sounds and styles in your head. Um, you know, I don't really, I don't write fiction myself, but I write a lot of nonfiction. Um, and I think that that actually helps a lot too. Um, so that's kind of how I go about it. Thank you very much. Diego Rodrigo has said that you work <laughs> with <laughs> this kind of skill. <laughs> Could you? you? Uh, yeah, okay. So. <laughs> Um, my, my very first translation, which which we had, well, it had a couple mistakes, <laughs> and we we just um, managed to publish a second edition with well, a lot of corrections, and it was uh, a book, well, uh, rather an anthology uh, made from made by a a Cabo Verdean author, a, a Portuguese anthology. Uh, his name is Jose Luis Tavares, uh, and he's he's really really good. But yeah, um, one of his uh, I think political like statements that he's made I, well, while he's writing is the fact that he's mostly publishing uh, his books both in Portuguese and in Criollo Cauerdiano. So uh, it's. Uh, he, I, I remember speaking with him about it, and he said that it's really important because most of Creole languages aren't really taught right now in in their their countries. So uh, the simple act of writing and publishing uh, a Creole language uh, is an act of preservation. So uh, we had a couple issues with him <laughs> because of um because of the of some of his uh, criollo translations uh, or rather trying to both uh, like trying to concertate both with his criollo part uh, the criollo part of a certain poem and a portuguese part uh, but that's that's in poetry. I know that uh, well, fiction has different rules. Uh, I, I've been working. I, I worked like the past couple of years in translating a Portuguese book that has um, a lot of parts in Creole, 
em crioulo é, caordiano também. E, and they, uh, we had to ask, well, José Luis, precisely, because I, I don't know <laughs> anything about crioulo. It has, um, because because the way uh, it's written is mostly phonetic, because it's it has no real, like, official uh, way of writing itself. So uh, it's we had to ask him about it, because we don't really know. Uh, I worked that translation with a professor of mine, and she she was constantly saying that most of Criollo can be understood by Portuguese people and Brazilian people, but trying to read it is a different, uh, like a different set of skills, and trying to translate it is even more difficult. Um, so yeah, about that book uh, and. Um, the first question I, i'm not a fiction writer <laughs> i i want to be someday um but i think um i agree with what rachel was saying it's really important to be able to read a lot and not only read a lot but also like being able to read outside your usual like comfort zone i've had to read i don't know i was thinking about it and for example I've had to learn about architecture in order to translate books into Spanish or I don't know uh, zoology also like there's there's a really long list of things that you end up learning about and it's like random <laughs> random facts that you can like speak about because uh, precisely the idea is to make it sound natural so when you are trying to translate something that for example has uh, architectural terms the idea is you must try it and translate it into uh, the local like field so yeah I, I think that it's not only uh, being a great reader but also being able to read from different fields and trying to pick up like different uh, the different languages they manage awesome awesome emily yara yana chiara oh, I, I can i can go yeah. all right so um i think just uh i saw this question actually pop up in the comments that also gave me some new thoughts on what i'm about to say um but first of all i think that translation um not only that you uh, your skill as a writer influences the way you translate, but this also happens the other way around. Um, a lot of the translators I know who are, sorry, a lot of the writers I know who are bilingual or multilingual are gradually more and more getting into translation because as they have discovered and also as I have discovered personally, um, this is really a way for us to hone our precise attention paid to language. And by doing that, it just feels like you're a lot more aware of what you're writing, um, of what you're typing, um, of the kind of different ways you can describe the same thing and to give it very different feelings. Because we all know that, and I've always been really for this um, aim, this mission is that translation should be viewed as an art and not just as some kind of a mechanical work that can be taken over easily by Google, let's say. And I mean, that's also this, ongoing joke, I guess, in our whole industry about how we're all going to lose our jobs one day. But the precise reason that we're still all hanging in there, um, we're all working, that literary translation is still alive and being watched by so many people right now is that translation stands on its own as a work of art. And in the act of doing that, it's not just about delivering the content, but in this case, the form is just as important as the content because in these capsules of languages, in the kind of terms you choose, in the kind of diction you choose um, that you want to represent your author with, that, al that already kind of creates this aura for your author. And as we know, different authors have different styles, they have different personalities, and the story isn't just all about the story, but it's fundamentally a rhetorical and aesthetical decision that you're making. And that is happening in your translation, this thing, this 
sculpture, this painting, if you view it that way, this thing you're creating together with your writer um, in this process. So yes, um, in general, I do agree that being a writer itself helps you gain that kind of awareness towards how language is being used. And more importantly, it helps you capture different authors' vibes. That's much more easier for you to view this translation as a piece of artwork that in some ways you're taking over the writer's role when you're producing the story in a different language. Um, you're not just kind of speaking as this emotionless machine who's delivering their concepts, delivering the gist, but you're really just essentially there as, if I can say, a secondary author to this entire world that you're creating. Um, so I think for me, it's more of a conceptual thing that's happening um, when I translate with the mindset of an author. Yeah, I would like to add something to this. Um, I uh, talking specifically about machine translations. That was the question, and Emily uh, mentioned it. I have experimented <laughs> with machine translation to translating fiction. Uh, I am not like completely against technology. I'm not completely against machine translation. But it's having said that. The result you get from a machine translation translating a, a work of fiction is not really fiction, I guess. Because when you get the translation from the machine, you have to change so much that you might as well have done it yourself. You know, uh, machine translation is great for maybe technical books and manuals i don't know uh but like emily said fiction is not only about words it's not only this word is this it's about subtlety and meaning and intention that a machine can't pick up yet <laughs> uh, and we are very 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 far away from a quality machine translation for fiction all the tools I've tried, they come off horrible to say the least, okay? So translators are not losing their jobs anytime soon. Uh, even when you have like, I have worked as a copy editing a machine translations for nonfiction books. And even then there is a lot that you, you have to change to make the paragraph make sense, to, to, to translate the idea, not the words, right? The intentions and, and everything. So uh, I just wanted to add that because I, I did try using machine translation. I will say it's uh, nice, uh, the, the structure, because using the structure of a uh, machine translation like WordFast or SmartCat, you don't miss uh, a paragraph or a sentence because it's all there listed, divided by lines. So you have segments. So uh, this is nice because it guarantees that you are not going to jump anything. This I like. Can I add something to Jana and Emily? Of course, Emma? Uh, yes. I, I completely agree with um, with Emily when she said uh, that uh, translation is like a work of art. And I think uh, it's important to focus on the fact that uh, translation, uh, when you translate, you always lose something and you get something. And the, 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 the one of... Uh, I think uh, a very useful strategy, I think, it's to focus on uh, the effect. So uh, to try to reproduce the effect that the, uh, native, uh, the native speaker, the native reader uh, gets when he reads the work in the, uh, uh, in the, in the first language. So um, if, you, if you do that, you don't focus on the on the on the translation of the single word, but you focus on on reproducing uh, this kind of effect, and that uh, that helps you a lot to get the right perspective. I think when you translate, uh, and that's called uh, dynamic uh, equivalence, and it's one of the many other uh, strategies that uh, a translation a translator can use. But of course, 
it, it's uh, it's it's a very good one if you do literary translation, I think. Yeah, very good answers, and thank Kelly Menoff for the question because it's a very interesting question. Do you guys want to add something about the machine learning translation process, or that's that's all? Um, yeah, I actually have one thing just to add about yeah. machine translation because um, that's actually been quite on my mind recently. Um, I suspect it's gonna go into my um, dissertation in the future. So it's actually one of the areas I'm exploring actively right now um, about machine translation. I think the one thing I've noticed, um, I guess just as my own personal niche here, is the context behind the word that it is translating. So even just if we leave out the big literary constructions out of the picture, um, so, for example, in the Chinese language, there are often many words, adjectives that are really specific. So you would say this person is beautiful, but this beautiful ref refers to a very specific kind of beauty um, that is restrained to a certain situation, a certain age, or a certain gender. Um, and that happens quite a lot in the Chinese language, and we have a lot of different ways of expressing different kinds of beauties. But when we plug that into a translator um, online, it comes out, almost all of it goes directly into beautiful and that's it. And um, the one thing I've gradually picked up as a trend, at least translating Chinese into English is that through machine translation, the contextual stuff often gets dropped out of the translation, leaving you at this very kind of like bland sentence and it just is there. Um, so I guess like, one of my like very preliminary thoughts on if we want to work better with machines in the future is probably that that can help you kind of like first put you in a kind of category. So your mind um, saves the work from determining what family this word, the sentence belongs to, and it's currently still up to the translators to make the embellishments and to add in the contextual stuff. But if in the future, if any engineers out there are listening, um, I guess like one future like idea um, that I have as someone who know nothing about machines, but know a little about translations is that I think paying attention to grabbing on contextual words in the sentences and kind of creating this kind of linkage between them that might really help pin down the precision, but I'm just gonna throw this out there. <laughs> So our tech guys who are watching us, take a note. That's a very good tip. And I will jump f uh, into this question by Snowflower. How challenging, challenging is for you to translate into a second language? That's a very interesting question as well. Who's gonna... I know that Emily does this, Yana does this. You mean like from my first language to a second language, right? That's it, yes. Well, it is very challenging because I, well, it's another language, not only that, but uh, this kind of subtleties of context that we were talking about, that uh, uh, recreating an effect that uh, a sentence or something that a character said in another language is uh, is hard and i mean i can speak for myself i i have never lived outside of brazil i learned english reading and watching tv so i didn't actually have like experience a, a, an anglophone culture outside of media you know i know it's not the same as living in canada or in the us or anywhere else that uh speaks English. So I never had this, this cultural proximity, but by reading incessantly and watching uh, a lot of stuff beyond, I mean, TV that is produced by a TV producer or Warner Brothers or whatever, uh, helps a lot. Like, it, it might sound funny, but... Uh, YouTube uh, creators that are in their own country talking freely without a script, they can give you ideas for like expressions and uh, slang and uh, 
uh, affectations and meaning that other stuff that is more produced doesn't have or is limited. Because what we see on TV is not exactly reality, right? Like, so I think uh, paying attention to these little things is is very interesting, uh, and also having in mind that, for example, when you have a language like English that that was born in a country that is cold, like England you're going to have a lot of words for storms and snow that we don't have in Portuguese. We have like two in Portuguese and that's it. So you have to remember that you're not going to use like snow, 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 snow. You're going to have to adapt a little bit. You have other vocabulary that you, you can use. And the, in the same way, like when you're translating from, from English to Portuguese, there's a lot of more words to, he said, in Portuguese than you have in, in English from my experience, okay? So I think really thinking about uh, context and a little bit of adapting. Uh, great. Um, sorry to to <laughs> to mispronounce the, the name of Kelling. The, mach the machine translator question was from Kelly Stensey. Thanks, Ker Kelly Nanov, to clarify for me. <laughs> Who's going to step in now? About second language? Um, I can add something, maybe. I, I think um, it's really challenging, uh, especially if you are, for example, in my case, I'm Italian and I am translated from the Chinese. So uh, there is a huge uh, geographical, cultural gap. Uh, so at least at, at the beginning, it was really uh, hard. But I think uh, this challenge also becomes the fascinating part because uh, you, also, you really get to explore and to make a journey into another culture when you translate. So for example, I remember one time there was a word, maz, and that was, uh, I couldn't understand it in, in the beginning, and that was a word for um, that stand for uh, so it was like a, Ma a Marxist um, uh, uh, philosopher, a, a figure that in the Chinese schools teaches uh, Marxism. And of course, I have no such a figure in Italy. But the process, the, the fact that I had to contact uh, a Chinese friend in order to understand what was that. And then, and then I, I, I could figure out this whole, uh, this whole different uh, system, uh, scholastic system was really fascinating. So I think the, the more uh, the challenge, the more the, the fascination part. Uh, so that's my, my thought. So I think we could make another question that's from our script. I think it's an interesting one was also as it, uh, it's from which source languages do you want to read more novels? Because Yana quoted uh, a Japanese work before. And Rachel, if you would like to begin this round. Sure, yeah, I, um, you know, I, I always like to find uh, Kind of SF and translation from languages that um, that aren't very well represented. So, for instance, there um, there was a an anthology of uh, Greek SF translation that came out recently, um, and I was I was so excited because we don't get a whole lot of that. Um, also, because some of the major um, Greek authors write directly in English, so I was really excited to to read some um, uh, SFT from uh, from Greece and from from Greek. And uh, you know, I've read um, uh, thanks to Kaylin Nenov. I've I've read um, uh, an anthology of Bulgarian SFT. Again, we don't get a whole lot of that. Um, uh, but you know, then again, there's um, there's Japanese SFT that uh, we've we've had a whole lot of, 
Um, but I can't seem to, to get enough of that because um, a lot of the books that I've, I've been reading, uh, especially the hard science fiction, um, I could I could just read all day. And, uh, you know, so I, I, I would love more from that. But yeah, most, mostly uh, I, I would love it to be a little more um, uh, well distributed. Um, so languages that we don't normally see uh, instead of, um, you know, a very kind of like we get a ton from like a few languages and a little bit from everybody else. So um, I think something like that will will happen with more, um, I guess, encouragement of of people to to become translators and to also um, learn other languages. Uh, I know in in the U.S., from what I can tell, it's just kind of language learning is um, generally uh, not that you know just not that encouraged you know it's it's like they'll offer one language and that's it um and it's i think it's a, a huge uh problem and i think that that it's taking away from the education um it's contributing to insulation you know and isolation and uh there's no reason for it <laughs> you know you can you can just uh really introduce um people to to much more um, just by teaching them other languages instead of being like, well, a lot of people speak English, so what's the point, you know? So um, that's what that's what what I would uh, that's what I would encourage. Very nice indeed. Um. So, oh. Okay. <laughs> okay, Diego, okay. then Iana. Yeah, Diego, then Iana. Go. Then Chiara, okay. Okay, so I think that the English market is pretty different than, uh, well, not only the Spanish market, but the Colombian one, because, uh, well, as a country, we don't have really, we don't have a lot of readers. So most, most, big publishing houses won't publish sci-fi or fantasy because it's a risk and it's a niche genre so most of them won't publish them or will only publish like the 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 big hitters let's 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 say for example uh, i think that the only <laughs> uh, chinese sci-fi book that's been completely translated uh, is uh, the trilogy of Xi Xin Liu uh, and a couple more books of him right now that were just published but I think Spanish language has a lot to learn from English uh, the, the English publishing uh, scene let's, let's say because uh, there's a lot of diversity, even if it's uh, harder to find. But uh, speaking from a, from a, from South America, it's really hard to to find uh, different uh, languages. For example, uh, uh, well, I started Vestigio because we were only finding uh, I don't know Isaac Asimov and. Ray Bradbury in in our in our market. So trying to the the idea, and I think that is it's something that's beginning to happen, is that there are a lot of small presses that are trying to reach different languages and trying to uh, bring uh, and trying to learn what's in different languages. Uh, I will say that I've been really curious because I read a couple books that blew my mind uh, of uh, French uh, weird fiction authors and fantasy authors and I really love to finding uh, way more of them uh, especially because there's like a whole I don't know a whole movement that's related to the weird fiction and trying to mix well sci-fi fantasy horror and adventure which i i really love like it's the it's the genre that we that both me and rodrigo try to publish the most um 
but yeah, for example, uh, even Italian. I've, I've read a couple of books uh, from Italian authors, but they're grossly <laughs> underrepresented in Spanish. So I, I think that uh, I'd really love, for example, yeah, even Romance languages, I think that need to be way more represented in, well, at least in the Colombian publishing scene. Yeah, uh, talking about Latin America, I think even when we talk about like Spanish and Portuguese and maybe uh, French from the Caribbean, we don't get a lot of diversity, at least in Brazil. Like we get the classics like Gabriel Garcia Marques, Isabel Allende, and that's it. You know, like you don't get contemporary writers and we become isolated from each other, right? If I can't read, if I don't have access to Colombian uh, literature, science fiction from Chile, from Mexico, from anywhere else, like we get distance from each other, even though we are technically close, right? We share a little bit of the same flavor maybe, although there are huge and vast differences and I think that's very det detrimental to creating and writing fiction in general because you really, you get stuck. You get stuck with stuff that was written 30, 40, 50 years ago. You don't read new stuff, you don't read new authors and you think that stuff from 50 years ago is the thing that's, I don't know, brand new or contemporary. When it's classics, okay, fair, but there's different stuff being written, like uh, weird fiction, like uh, Diego mentioned. It's very, 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 very unknown in Brazil. You know, so it's hard. I would like to read more from more writers, contemporary writers from South America, from Latin America in general. I would love to read more uh, Southeast Asian literature, East Asian literature. I'm going through a little bit of a phase, so <laughs> there is that. And uh, uh, really, anything anything different, give me something, <laughs> you know. And in Portuguese, give me not only in English, but in Portuguese, something that I can share with my friends and not be like, well, I read this stuff and I can't talk about, I can't recommend to anyone because they don't read in English. That's how I started translating fan fiction because I wanted my friends to read that. I wanted to have someone to talk about, you know? Sure, <laughs> sure I know. Chiara, do you want to add? Uh, yeah, I, to be honest, I, I remember I was uh, in China a couple of years ago and uh, there, was, uh, there were some panels about uh, Korean science fiction. And I, to be honest, I, I, I really would like to know more about it. Um, so we know of, right now, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese science fiction is really popular and uh, we loved it. We, we love it. But um, as uh, Yama said, from uh, other parts of Asia, uh, reading something from other parts of Asia, I think would be um, really interesting and since i know uh, interesting things have been written in korea i i would really love to to, to read to, to know something to know something more about uh, about it yeah me me too Emily, do you would want to add something about this topic yeah, I think everyone else really gave like very elaborate and elegant speeches about what they want to see. And I think just to pull this all together, um, I guess the trend that I've also been noticing is that it's not only that we have to look outside of the mainstream languages, but in a way, I think I know that Francesco posted um, this edition of FutureCon is called Decolonize the Future, but also in a way, I feel like the entire genre of science fiction itself should also be decolonized. Um, because the way we define science fiction right now, um, I've, I've been noticing this throughout our conversation, is that it is very narrow. 
And that a lot of people um, also in my home country, when they speak of science fiction, it's still very much shaped by um, what they've grown up reading, um, the classic Asimov, the kind of golden age English science fiction in general. And that's been their entire understanding of what this genre is supposed to be. Um, spaceships and facts. And that's what we call hard science fiction, quote unquote. Um, then I guess in country, we don't really have specific terms that are already widely used on the market for promoting fiction that's also under the general science fiction family, but does not fit into that kind of category. Um, and as a result, I feel like forming these small enclosed communities, um, determining what science fiction should be is also limiting the way that science fiction is being translated in and out of China. Um, so for example, I know that Diego mentioned um, the weird, and I know that in a lot of countries, the way they write fiction, it can include a lot of fantastical or futuristic elements, but the stories themselves don't necessarily fall under what we know as science fiction. And I know that Kiara mentioned Han Song, which is a writer who embraces so many techniques of the surreal, the grotesque, and he's also not what you would say a classic hard science fiction writer um, per se. So I guess like these are the people, these are the underrepresented authors or smaller subgenres or just cultural trends that generally fall through the cracks, at least in my understanding of what the Chinese market is like. So, oh, oh my God. <laughs> Thank you, Francesco. I am flattered. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Francesco. Well, now it's time for our closing remarks. And before it goes, I would like to thank you very much, the Chilean Science Fiction and Fantasy Literature Association, for all the all the help they gave us. Hotape, who is here with us in the backstage. Well, now you could like make book announcements, invite people to read the magazines, and for the questions that are still in our chat, I would encourage you to put them in our Discord channel. There is like the general chat, you could put them and let's discuss this for I don't know, another time and don't lose this connection we are building already. So uh, we can go like the by the alphabetical order for pronoun from names like we go uh, Kia, uh, Chiara, Diego, Emily, Yana, and then Rachel for the final remarks. Okay. Um, so as for final remarks, I don't have uh, any special book announcements <laughs> to make. Uh, but I can uh, tell our Italian reader that uh, we, we did publish actually an anthology uh, collecting some of Hanson short stories. So who's willing to, to read uh, something really interesting about um, from him? Although it's not a novel yet, but uh, it's possible to do that. And, um, and thank you everyone for the really the amazing speeches and the, 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 the company and it has been a great honor and and I leave the floor to uh, my co-panelist, Diego. <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you so much to everyone. I, I'm really humbled by uh, speaking here with you guys. It's it's amazing. Right? Uh, but yeah, let's see about announcements. Well, we are best at Bestie here. We have been working around three years now, three years and a half. Uh, publishing weird fiction, bizarre fiction. Uh, right now, uh, as I'm uh, like learning more and more of Brazilian sci-fi, we are trying to. We'll we'll start uh, hopefully next year or at the end of this year publishing as uh, one book from uh, a weird author precisely, and then we'll try to expand upon it. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I really love uh, like being able to hear your viewpoints on these topics, uh, and I've got like a lot of different recommendations to read through and to learn about, which is wonderful, really. Yes, um, thank you everyone for 
the invitation for the talk. I, I am leaving here with a lot to read. So let's see how that goes. Um, I have a short story that hopefully will be translated. It's a little um, weird fiction uh, thing that I wrote in Portuguese that it still doesn't have like a date to come out. So you can uh, follow me on Twitter to, to uh, uh, check it out. Uh, I am Iana TXT on Twitter. And uh, uh, well, ETA Magazine will be uh, publishing issue number two on November. So it's going to be bilingual. So you can read it in English and you can read it in Portuguese. It's going to have a lot of awesome stuff from science fiction to stuff that's really hard to <laughs> pin. And uh, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, let's keep uh, translating and, and uniting as much as we can. Yeah, um, thank you all so much. Um, it is a great honor for me to be here. And I definitely harvested so much regs and knowledge and general love from my fellow panelists and today has been just a very great rewarding kind of night for me um and i do have two announcements actually um i have two major projects uh coming out um one in the fall and one next spring so the first one the title is ai 2041 10 visions for our future by dr kai fu lee who um, was the former president of google china and Chen Jiufen, who is a very widely known um, Chinese science fiction writer. So they co-wrote this book. Um, and in the book, it basically includes 10 short stories. I translated, I think half or over half, I don't remember, um, but it depicts um, 10 different kinds of futures set in 10 different cities around the world. So it's a very global book in its own right um, about how AI is gonna kind of impact our lives. It's kind of tech plus science fiction. Um, so it's an interesting combination, check that out. And the other project is kind of like my own baby. Um, the title is The Way Spring Arrives and Other Stories, edited by Yu Chen and Regina Kami Wang. So it's a collaboration between Tor and Storycom, which is a China-based writer's agency company who's been working on the forefront of um, Chinese-English science, science fiction translations. Um, and this anthology is really cool because it features a whole crew of female and non-binary creators, mm -hmm. editors, translators, writers, um, everyone in this cast are all just female and non-binary. Um, and that's kind of the way we are trying to put ourselves out there that Chinese science fiction isn't all about big names, which are men. Um, so I think these two projects will be cool. Both are cool in their own right. And um, hang on, I'm just gonna type the names and yeah, um, follow me on Twitter. I'll be posting ads Uh, first, I want to say I'm really sorry I was so late. Google lied to me. Uh, I typed in Santiago time and Chicago time, and it told me 11, so whatever. Uh, anyway, sorry. Um, so I just wanted to say I'm so happy to be with all of you. It's fabulous and fun talking um, translation and um, speculative fiction around the world. Uh, I would... Um, Tell everyone to go to sfintranslation.com um, where there's always like, uh, you know, what's coming out and, you know, it's, it's all what's coming into English, uh, what to read, um, uh, reviews, and uh, sometimes some original fiction. Uh, also, my, um, as I mentioned before, my book, uh, Out of This World, Speculative Fiction and Translation from the Cold War to the New Millennium is coming out from Illinois, uh, University of Illinois Press um, at the end of the year. And also a plug for um, the collection of stories by um, Clelia Farris that I translated along with Jennifer Delaire called um, Creative Surgery. And it's, um, it's a mix of kind of weird sci-fi, sometimes fantastical stories um, she has such a fabulous voice. Um, Chloe is the best. Um, and that's out from Rosarian Publishing. came out last year. Um, so, yeah, thank you to everyone. Lee, thank you so much. So 
Thank you very much for such a good panel. You are gods, like like Tiago was saying about Ursula Le Guin's wow. forest is the the word for words forest. And thank you so much. And if you are watching us, stay for the next panel because we are going to discuss magazines and they are doing amazing things in the science in the science fiction field okay so gente tchau tchau muito obrigada thank you very much tchau 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 obrigada graças tchau <laughs>